Section eight of Pirates of Panama The Buccaneers of America by A. O. Esquemelin, translated by G. A. Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Heather and By. Chapter six of the origin of Francis Lalinois and the beginning of his robberies. Francis Lalinois was a native of that territory in France which is called Les Sables d'Alone, or the Sands of Alone. In his youth he was transported to the Caribbee Islands, in quality of a servant or slave, according to custom, of which we have already spoken. Being out of his time, he came to Hispaniola. Here he joined for some time with hunters, before he began his robberies, upon the Spaniards, which I shall now relate till his unfortunate death. At first he made two or three voyages as a common mariner, wherein he behaved himself so courageously as to gain the favour of the governor of Tortuga, Monsieur de la Place, insomuch that he gave him a ship, in which he might seek his fortune, which was very favourable to him at first, for in a short time he got great riches. But his cruelties against the Spaniards were such that the fame of them made him so well known through the Indies that the Spaniards, in his time, would choose rather to die or sink fighting than surrender, knowing they should have no mercy at his hands. But fortune, being seldom constant, after some time turned her back, for in a huge storm he lost his ship on the coast of Campeche. The men were all saved, but coming upon dry land, the Spaniards pursued them and killed the greatest part, wounding also Lalinois. Not knowing how to escape, he saved his life by a stratagem, mingling sand with the blood of his wounds, with which, besmearing his face and other parts of his body, and hiding himself dexterously among the dead, he continued there till the Spaniards quitted the field. They being gone, he retired to the woods, and bound up his wounds as well as he could. These being pretty well healed, he took his way to Campeche, having disguised himself in a Spanish habit. Here he enticed certain slaves, to whom he promised liberty if they would obey him and trust to his conduct. They accepted his promises, and stealing a canoe, they went to sea with him. Now the Spaniards, having made several of his companions prisoners, kept them close in a dungeon, while Lalanaz went about the town and saw what passed. They were often asked, What is become of your captain? To whom they constantly answered, He is dead, which rejoiced the Spaniards, who made bonfires, and knowing nothing to the contrary, gave thanks to God for their deliverance from such a cruel pirate. Lalanois, having seen these rejoicings for his death, made haste to escape, with the slaves above mentioned, and came safe to Tortuga, the common refuge of all sorts of wickedness, and the seminary, as it were, of pirates and thieves. Though now his fortune was low, yet he got another ship with craft and subtlety, and in it twenty-one men. Being well provided with arms and necessaries, he set forth for Cuba, on the south whereof is a small village, called de los Caos. The inhabitants drive a great trade in tobacco, sugar, and hides, and all in boats, not being able to use ships by reason of the little depth of that sea. Lalanois was persuaded he should get here some considerable prey, but by the good fortune of some fishermen who saw him, and the mercy of God, they escaped him, for the inhabitants of the town dispatched immediately a vessel overland to the Havana, complaining that Lalanois was come to destroy them with two canoes. The governor could hardly believe this, having received letters from Campeche that he was dead, but at their importunity he sent a ship to their relief with ten guns and ninety men well armed, giving them this express command, that they should not return into his presence without having totally destroyed those pirates. To this effect he gave them a negro to serve for a hangman, and orders that they should immediately hang every one of the pirates, excepting Lalanois, their captain, whom they should bring alive to the Havana. The ship arrived at Chaos, of whose coming the pirates were advertised beforehand, and instead of flying, went to seek it in the river Estera, where she rode at anchor. The pirates seized some fishermen, and forced them by night to show them the entry of the port, hoping soon to obtain a greater vessel than their two canoes, and thereby to mend their fortune. They arrived after two in the morning, very nigh the ship, and the watch on board the ship asking them whence they came, if they had seen any pirates abroad, they caused one of the prisoners to answer, they had seen no pirates nor anything else. 
which answer made them believe that they were fled upon hearing of their coming. But they soon found the contrary, for about break of day the pirates assaulted the vessel on both sides, with their two canoes, with such vigour, that though the Spaniards behaved themselves as they ought, and made as good a defence as they could, making some use of their great guns, yet they were forced to surrender, being beaten by the pirates, with sword in hand, down under the hatches. From hence Lalinois commanded them to be brought up one by one, and in this order caused their heads to be struck off. Among the rest came up the negro, designed to be the pirate's executioner. This fellow implored mercy at his hands very dolefully, telling Lalinois he was constituted hangman of that ship, and if he would spare him, he would tell him faithfully all that he should desire." Lalonois, making him confess what he thought fit, commanded him to be murdered with the rest. Thus he cruelly and barbarously put them all to death, reserving only one alive, whom he sent back to the governor of the Havana with this message in writing, I shall never henceforward give quarter to any Spaniard whatsoever, and I have great hopes I shall execute on your own person the very same punishment I have done upon them you sent against me. Thus I have retaliated the kindness you designed to me and my companions." The governor, much troubled at this sad news, swore in the presence of many that he would never grant quarter to any pirate that should fall into his hands. But the citizens of the Havana desired him not to persist in the execution of that rash and rigorous oath, seeing the pirates would certainly take the occasion from thence to do the same, and they had an hundred times more opportunity of revenge than he. That being necessitated to get their livelihood by fishery, they should hereafter always be in danger of their lives. By these reasons he was persuaded to bridle his anger, and remit the severity of his oath. Now Lalinois had got a good ship, but very few provisions and people in it, to purchase both which he resolved to cruise from one port to another. Doing this for some time without success, he determined to go to the port of Maracaibo. Here he surprised a ship laden with plate, and other merchandises outward bound to buy cocoa-nuts. With this prize he returned to Tortuga, where he was received with joy by the inhabitants. They congratulated his happy success, and their own private interest. He stayed not long there, but designed to equip a fleet sufficient to transport five hundred men and necessaries. Thus provided, he resolved to pillage both cities, towns, and villages, and finally to take Maracaibo itself. For this purpose he knew the island of Tortuga would afford him many resolute and courageous men, fit for such enterprises. Besides, he had in his service several prisoners well acquainted with the ways and places designed upon. End of chapter 6《of Panama, the Buccaneers of America, by A. O. Exclamelin, translated by G. A. Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Acacia Wood. Chapter 7, Part 1. Lillinois equips a fleet to land upon the Spanish islands of America, with intent to rob, sack, and burn whatsoever he met with. Of this design, Lolonoi, giving notice to all the pirates, whether at home or abroad, he got together in a little while above four hundred men, beside which there was then in Tortuga another pirate, named Miguel de Basco, who by his piracy had got riches sufficient to live at ease, and go no more abroad, having withal the office of major of the island. But seeing the great preparations that Lolonoi made for this expedition, he joined him, and offered him that if he would make him his chief captain by land, seeing he knew the country very well, and all its avenues, he would share in his fortunes, and go with him. They agreed upon articles to the great joy of Lolonois, knowing that Basco had done great actions in Europe, and had the repute of a good soldier. Thus they all embarked in eight vessels, that of Lolonois being the greatest, having ten guns of indifferent carriage. All things being ready, and the whole company on board, they set sail together about the end of April, being in all six hundred and sixty persons. They steered for that part called Bayala, north of Hispianola. Here they took into their company some French hunters, who voluntarily offered themselves, 
and here they provided themselves with victuals necessaries for their voyage from hence they sailed again the last of july and steered directly to the eastern cape of the isle called punta de espada hereabouts espying a ship from puerto rico bound for new spain laden with coconuts lolonoi commanded the rest of the fleet to wait for him near savona on the east of cape punta de espada he alone intending to take the said vessel the spaniards though they had been in sight full two hours and knew them to be pirates yet would not flee but prepared to fight being well armed and provided the combat lasted three hours and then they surrendered this ship had sixteen guns and fifty fighting men aboard they found in her a hundred and twenty thousand weight of cocoa forty thousand pieces of eight and the value of ten thousand more in jewels lolonois sent the vessel presently to tortuga to be unladed with orders to return as soon as possible to savona where he would wait for them meanwhile the rest of the fleet being arrived at savona met another spanish vessel coming from coman with military provisions to hispaniola and money to pay the garrisons there this vessel they also took without any resistance though mounted with eight guns in it were seven thousand weight of powder a great number of muskets and like things with twelve thousand pieces of eight these successes encouraged the pirates they seemingly very lucky beginnings especially finding their fleet pretty well recruited in a little time for the first ship arriving at tortuga the governor ordered it to be instantly unladen and soon after sent back with fresh provisions and other necessaries to lolonois this ship he chose for himself and gave that which he commanded to his comrade anthony dupuis being thus recruited with men in lieu of them he had lost in taking the prizes and by sickness he found himself in a good condition to set sail for maracabo in the province of nueva venezuela in the latitude of twelve degrees ten minutes north this island is twenty leagues long and twelve broad to this port also belong the islands of onega and monges the east side thereof is called cape st roman and the western side cape of Cacibocoa. the gulf is called by some the gulf of venezuela but the pirates usually call it the bay of maracabo at the entrance of this gulf are two islands extending from east to west that towards the east is called isla de la vigilias or the watch isle because in the middle is a high hill on which stands a watch house the other is called isla de la palomas or the isle of pigeons between these two islands runs a little sea or rather lake of fresh water sixty leagues long and thirty broad which disgorging itself into the ocean dilates itself about the said two islands between them is the best passage for ships the channel being no broader than the flight of a great gun of about eight pounds on the isle of pigeons stand at the castle to impede the entry of vessels all being necessitated to come very nigh the castle by reason of two banks of sand on the other side with only fourteen feet water many other banks of sand there are in this lake as that called el tablazo or the great table no deeper than ten feet forty leagues within the lake others there are that have no more than six seven or eight feet in depth all are very dangerous especially to mariners unacquainted with them west hereof is the city of maracabo very pleasant to the view its houses being built along the shore having delightful prospects all round the city may contain three or four thousand persons slaves included all which make a town of reasonable bigness they are judged to be about eight hundred persons able to bear arms all spaniards here are one parish church well built and adorned four monasteries and one hospital the city is governed by a deputy governor substituted by the governor of the caracas the trade here exercised is mostly in hides and tobacco the inhabitants possess great numbers of cattle and many plantations which extend thirty leagues in the country especially towards the great town of gibraltar where are gathered great quantities of coconuts and all other garden fruits which serve for the regale and sustenance of the inhabitants of maracabo whose territories are much drier than those of gibraltar hither those of maracabo send great quantities of flesh they making returns in oranges lemons and other fruits for the inhabitants of gibraltar want flesh their fields not being capable of feeding cows or sheep before maracabo is a very spacious and secure port 
wherein may be built all sorts of vessels having great convenience of timber which may be transported thither at little charge nigh the town lies also a small island called borica where they feed a great number of goats which cattle the inhabitants use more for their skins than their flesh or milk they sliding these two unless while they are tender and young kids in the fields are fed some sheep but of a very small size in some islands of the lake and in other places hereabouts are many savage indians called by the spaniards bravos or wild these could never be reduced by the spaniards being brutish and untamable they dwell mostly towards the west side of the lake in little huts built on trees growing in the water so to keep themselves from innumerable mosquitoes or gnats which infest and torment them night and day to the east of the said lake are whole towns of fishermen who likewise live in huts built on trees as the former another reason of this dwelling is the frequent inundations for after great rains the land is often overflown for two or three leagues there being no less than twenty-five great rivers that feed this lake the town of gibraltar is also frequently drowned by these so that the inhabitants are constrained to retire to their plantations gibraltar situated at the side of the lake about forty leagues within it receives its provisions of flesh as has been said from maracabo the town is inhabited by about one thousand five hundred persons whereof four hundred may bear arms the greatest part of them keep shops wherein they exercise one trade or another in the adjacent fields are numerous plantations of sugar and cocoa in which are many tall and beautiful trees of whose timber houses may be built and ships among these are many handsome and proportionable cedars seven or eight feet about of which they can build boats and ships so as to bear only one great sail such vessels being called piraguas the whole country is well furnished with rivers and brooks very useful in droughts being then cut into many little channels to water their fields and plantations they plant also much tobacco well esteemed in europe and for its goodness is called their tobacco de saracotas or priest's tobacco they enjoy nigh twenty leagues of jurisdiction which is bounded by very high mountains perpetually covered with snow on the other side of these mountains is situate a great city called marida to which the town of gibraltar is subject all merchandise is carried hence to the aforesaid city on mules and that but at one season of the year by reason of the excessive cold in those high mountains on the said mules returns are made in flour of meal which comes from towards peru by the way of estafe thus far i thought good to make a short description of the lake of maracabo that my reader might the better comprehend what i shall say concerning the actions of pirates in this place as follows lolonois arriving at the gulf of venezuela cast anchor with his whole fleet out of sight of the vigilia or watch isle next day very early he set sail thence with all the ships for the lake of maracabo where they cast anchor again then they landed their men with design to attack first the fortress that commanded the bar therefore called de la barra this fort consists only of several great baskets of earth placed on a rising ground planted with sixteen great guns with several other heaps of earth round about for covering their men the pirates having landed a league off this fort advanced by degrees towards it but the governor having espied their landing had placed an ambuscade to cut them off behind while he should attack them in front this the pirates discovered and getting before they defeated it so entirely that not a man could retreat to the castle this done lolonois with his companions advanced immediately to the fort and after a fight of almost three hours with the usual desperation of this sort of people they became masters thereof without any other arms than swords and pistols while they were fighting those who were the routed ambuscade not being able to get into the castle retired into maracabo in great confusion and disorder crying the pirates will presently be here with two thousand men and more the city having formerly been taken by this kind of people and sacked to the uttermost had still an idea of that misery so that upon these dismal news they endeavoured to escape towards gibraltar in their boats and canoes carrying with them all the goods and money they could bring being come to gibraltar they told how the fortress was taken and nothing had been saved nor any persons escaped 
the castle thus taken by the pirates they presently signified to the ships their victory that they should come farther in without fear of danger the rest of that day was spent in ruining and demolishing the said castle they nailed the guns and burnt as much as they could not carry away burying the dead and sending on board the fleet the wounded next day very early they weighed anchor and steered altogether towards Maracabo, about six leagues distant from the fort but the wind failing that day they could advance little being forced to expect the tide next morning they came in sight of the town and prepared for landing under the protection of their own guns fearing the spaniards might have laid an ambuscade in the woods they put their men into canoes brought for that purpose and landed where they thought most convenient shooting still furiously with their great guns of those in the canoes half only went ashore the other half remained aboard they fired from the ships as fast as possible towards the woody part of the shore but could discover nobody then they entered the town whose inhabitants as i told you were retired to the woods and gibraltar with their wives children and families their houses they left well provided with victuals as flour bread pork brandy wines and poultry with these the pirates fell to making good cheer for in four weeks before they had no opportunity of filling their stomachs with such plenty they instantly possessed themselves of the best houses in the town and placed sentinels wherever they thought convenient the great church served them for their main guard next day they sent out a hundred and sixty men to find out some of the inhabitants in the woods thereabouts these returned the same night bringing with them twenty thousand pieces of eight several mules laden with household goods and merchandise and twenty prisoners men women and children some of these were put to the rack to make them confess where they had hid the rest of the goods but they could extort very little from them lolonois who valued not murdering though in cold blood ten or twelve spaniards drew his cutlass and hacked one to pieces before the rest saying if you do not confess and declare where you have hid the rest of your goods i will do the like to all your companions at last amongst these horrible cruelties and inhuman threats one promised to show the place where the rest of the spaniards were hid but those that were fled having intelligence of it changed place and buried the remnant of their riches underground so that the pirates could not find them out unless some of their own party should reveal them besides the spaniards flying from one place to another every day and often changing woods were jealous even of each other so as the father durst scarce trust his own son end of chapter seven part one recording by acacia wood of panama the buccaneers of america by a o exquemelin translated by g a williams this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by acacia wood chapter seven part two after the pirates had been fifteen days in maracabo they resolved for gibraltar but the inhabitants having received intelligence thereof and that they intended afterwards to go to merida gave notice of it to the governor there who was a valiant soldier and had been an officer in flanders his answer was he would have them take no care for he hoped in a little while to exterminate the said pirates whereupon he came to gibraltar with four hundred men well armed ordering at the same time the inhabitants to put themselves in arms so that in all he made eight hundred fighting men with the same speed he raised a battery toward the sea mounted with twenty guns covered with great baskets of earth another battery he placed in another place mounted with eight guns this done he barricaded a narrow passage to the town through which the pirates must pass opening at the same time another through much dirt and mud into the wood totally unknown to the pirates the pirates ignorant of these preparations having embarked all their prisoners and booty took their way towards gibraltar being come in sight of the place they saw the royal standard hanging forth and that those of the town designed to defend their houses lolonois seeing this called a council of war what they ought to do telling his officers and mariners that the difficulty of the enterprise was very great seeing the spaniards had had so much time to put themselves in a posture of defence and had got a good body of men together with much ammunition but notwithstanding said he have good courage we must either defend ourselves like good soldiers or lose our lives with all the riches we have got do as i shall do who am your captain 
at other times we have fought with fewer men than we have in our company at present and yet we have overcome greater numbers than there possibly can be in this town the more they are the more glory and the greater riches we shall gain the pirates supposed that all the riches of the inhabitants of maracabo were transported to gibraltar or at least the greatest part after this speech they all promised to follow and obey him lolonois made answer tis well but know ye withal that the first man who shall show any fear or the least apprehension thereof i will pistol him with my own hands with this resolution they cast anchor nigh the shore near three quarters of a league from the town next day before sun rising they landed three hundred and eighty men well provided and armed every one with a cutlass and one or two pistols and sufficient powder and bullet for thirty charges here they all shook hands in testimony of good courage and began their march lolonois speaking thus come my brethren follow me and have good courage they followed their guide who believing he led them well brought them to the way which the governor had barricaded not being able to pass that way they went to the other newly made in the wood among the mire which the spaniards could shoot into at pleasure but the pirates full of courage cut down the branches of trees and threw them on the way that they might not stick in the dirt meanwhile those of gibraltar fired with their great guns so furiously they could scarce hear nor see for the noise and smoke being past the wood they came on firm ground where they met with a battery of six guns which immediately the spaniards discharged upon them all loaded with small bullets and pieces of iron and the spaniards sallying forth set upon them with such fury as caused the pirates to give way few of them caring to advance towards the fort many of them being already killed and wounded this made them go back to seek another way but the spaniards having cut down many trees to hinder the passage they could find none but were forced to return to that they had left here the spaniards continued to fire as before nor would they sally out of their batteries to attack them any more lolonois and his companions not being able to grimp up the baskets of earth were compelled to use an old stratagem wherewith at last they deceived and overcame the spaniards lolonois retired suddenly with all his men making show as if he fled hereupon the spaniards crying out they flee they flee let us follow them sallied forth with great disorder to the pursuit being drawn to some distance from the batteries which was the pirates only design they turned upon them unexpectedly with sword in hand and killed above two hundred men and thus fighting their way through those who remained they possessed themselves of the batteries the spaniards that remained abroad giving themselves over for lost fled to the woods those in the battery of eight guns surrendered themselves obtaining quarter for their lives the pirates being now become masters of the town pulled down the spanish colours and set up their own taking prisoners as many as they could find these they carried to the great church where they raised a battery of several great guns fearing lest the spaniards that were fled should rally and come upon them again but next day being all fortified their fears were over they gathered the dead to bury them being above five hundred spaniards besides the wounded in the town and those that died of their wounds in the woods the pirates had also above one hundred and fifty prisoners and nigh five hundred slaves many women and children of their own companions only forty were killed and almost eighty wounded whereof the greatest part died through the bad air which brought fevers and other illness they put the slain spaniards into two great boats and carrying them a quarter of a league to sea they sunk the boats this done they gathered all the plate household stuff and merchandise they could or thought convenient to carry away the spaniards who had anything left had hid it carefully but the unsatisfied pirates not contented with the riches they had got sought for more goods and merchandise not sparing those who lived in the fields such as hunters and planters they had scarce been eighteen days on the place when the greatest part of the prisoners died for hunger for in the town were few provisions especially of flesh though they had some but no sufficient quantity of flour of meal and this the pirates had taken for themselves as they also took the swine cows sheep and poultry without allowing any share to the poor prisoners for these they only provided some small quantity of mules and asses flesh and many who could not eat of that loathsome provision died for hunger their stomachs not being accustomed to such sustenance of the prisoners many also died under the torment they sustained to make them discover their money or jewels and of these some had none nor knew of none and others denying what they knew endured such horrible deaths finally after having been in possession of the town four entire weeks they sent four of the prisoners to the spaniards that were fled to the woods demanding of them a ransom for not burning the town the sum demanded was ten thousand pieces of eight which if not sent they threatened to reduce it to ashes 
for bringing in this money they allowed them only two days but the spaniards not having been able to gather so punctually such a sum the pirates fired many parts of the town whereupon the inhabitants begged them to help quench the fire and the ransom should be readily paid the pirates condescended helping as much as they could to stop the fire but notwithstanding all their best endeavours one part of the town was ruined especially the church belonging to the monastery was burnt down after they had received the said sum they carried aboard all the riches they had got with a great number of slaves which had not paid the ransom for all the prisoners had sums of money set upon them and the slaves were also commanded to be redeemed hence they returned to maticabo where being arrived they found a general consternation in the whole city to which they sent three or four prisoners to tell the governor inhabitants they should bring them thirty thousand pieces of eight aboard their ships for a ransom of their houses otherwise they should be sacked anew and burnt among these debates a party of pirates came on shore and carried away the images pictures and bells of the great church aboard the fleet the spaniards who were sent to demand the sum aforesaid returned with orders to make some agreement who concluded with the pirates to give for their ransom and liberty twenty thousand pieces of eight and five hundred cows provided that they should commit no further hostilities but depart thence presently after payment of money and cattle the one and the other being delivered the whole fleet set sail causing great joy to the inhabitants of maracabo to see themselves quit of them but three days after they renewed their fears with admiration seeing the pirates appear again and re-enter the port with all their ships but these apprehensions vanished upon hearing one of the pirates errand who came ashore from lolonois to demand a skilful pilot to conduct one of the greatest ships over the dangerous bank that lieth at the very entry of the lake which petition or rather command was instantly granted they had now been full two months in those towns wherein they committed those cruel and insolent actions we have related departing thence they took their course to hispaniola and arrived there in eight days casting anchor in a port called isla de la baja or cow island this island is inhabited by french buccaneers who mostly sell the flesh they hunt to pirates and others who now and then put in there to victual or trade here they unladed their whole cargazon of riches the usual storehouse of the pirates being commonly under the shelter of the buccaneers here they made a dividend of all their prizes and gains according to the order and degree of every one as has been mentioned before having made an exact calculation of all their plunder they found in ready money two hundred sixty thousand pieces of eight this being divided every one received for his share in money as also in silk linen and other commodities to the value of above one hundred pieces of eight those who had been wounded received their first part after the rate mentioned before for the loss of their limbs then they weighed all the plate uncoined reckoning ten pieces of eight to a pound the jewels were prized indifferently either too high or too low by reason of their ignorance this done every one was put to his oath again that he had not smuggled anything from the common stock hence they proceeded to the dividend of the shares of such as were dead in battle or otherwise these shares were given to their friends to be kept entire for them and to be delivered in due time to their nearest relations or their apparent lawful heirs the whole dividend being finished they set sail for tortuga here they arrived a month after to the great joy of most of the island for as to the common pirates in three weeks they had scarce any money left having spent it all in things of little value or lost it at play here had arrived not long before them two french ships with wine and brandy and such like commodities whereby these liquors at the arrival of the pirates were indifferent cheap but this lasted not long for soon after they were enhanced extremely a gallon of brandy being sold for four pieces of eight the governor of the island bought of the pirates the whole cargo of the ship laden with cocoa giving for that rich commodity scarce the twentieth part of its worth thus they made shift to lose and spend the riches they had got in much less time than they were purchased the taverns and stews according to the custom of pirates got the greatest part so that soon after they were forced to seek more by the same unlawful means they had got the former end of chapter seven part two recording by acacia wood of pirates of panama the buccaneers of america by a o exquemelin translated by g a williams this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by acacia wood chapter eight part one lolonois makes new preparations to make the city of st james de leon as also that of nicaragua where he miserably perishes lolonois had got great repute at tortuga by this last voyage because he brought home such considerable profit and now he need take no great care to gather men to serve under him 
more coming in voluntarily than he could employ every one reposing such confidence in his conduct that they judged it very safe to expose themselves in his company to the greatest dangers he resolved therefore a second voyage to the parts of nicaragua to pillage there as many towns as he could having published his new preparations he had all his men together at the time being about seven hundred of these he put three hundred aboard the ship he took at maracabo and the rest in five other vessels of lesser burthen so that they were in all six ships the first port they went to was bayaja in hispaniola to victual the fleet and take in provisions which done they steered their course to a port called matamana on the south side of cuba intending to take here all the canoes they could these coasts being frequented by the fishers of tortoises who carry them hence to the havana they took as many of them to the great grief of those miserable people as they thought necessary for they had great use for these small bottoms by reason the port they designed for had not depth enough for ships of any burthen hence they took their course towards the cape gracias a dios on the continent in latitude fifteen degrees north one hundred leagues from the island de los pinos being at sea they were taken with a sad and tedious calm and by the agitation of the waves alone were thrown into the gulf of honduras here they laboured hard in vain to regain what they had lost both the waters and the winds being contrary besides the ship where lolonoi was embarked could not follow the rest and what was worse they wanted provisions hereupon they were forced to put into the first port they could reach to revictual so they entered with their canoes into the river zagua inhabited by indians whom they totally destroyed finding great quantities of millet and many hogs and hens not contented with which they determined to remain there till the bad weather was over and to pillage all the towns and villages along the coast of the gulf thus they passed from one place to another seeking still more provisions with which they were not sufficiently supplied having searched and rifled many villages where they found no great matter they came at last to porta caballo here the spaniards have two storehouses to keep the merchandises that are brought from the inner parts of the country till the arrival of the ships there was then in the port a spanish ship of twenty-four guns and sixteen pedreros or mortar pieces this ship was immediately seized by the pirates and then drawing nigh the shore they landed and burnt the two storehouses with all the rest of the houses there many inhabitants likewise they took prisoners and committed upon them the most inhuman cruelties that ever heathens invented putting them to the cruelest tortures they could devise it was the custom of lolonois that having tormented persons not confessing he would instantly cut them in pieces with his hanger and pull out their tongues desiring to do so if possible to every spaniard in the world it often happened that some of these miserable prisoners being forced by the rack would promise to discover the places where the fugitive spaniards lay hid which not being able afterwards to perform they were put to more cruel deaths than they who were dead before the prisoners being all dead but two whom they reserved to show them what they desired they marched hence to the town of san pedro or st peter ten or twelve leagues from porta caballo being three hundred men whom lolonois led leaving behind him moses van ven his lieutenant to govern the rest in his absence being come three leagues on their way they met with a troop of spaniards who lay in ambuscade for their coming these they set upon with all the courage imaginable and at last totally defeated howbeit they behaved themselves very manfully at first but not being able to resist the fury of the pirates they were forced to give way and save themselves by flight leaving many pirates dead in the place some wounded and some of their own party maimed by the way these lolonois put to death without mercy having asked them what questions he thought fit for his purpose there were still remaining some few prisoners not wounded these were asked by lolonois if any more spaniards did lie farther or in ambuscade they answered there were then being brought before him one by one he asked if there was no other way to town but that this he did to avoid if possible those ambuscades but they all constantly answered him they knew none having asked them all and finding they could show him no other way lolonois grew outrageously passionate so that he drew his cutlass and with it cut open the breast of one of those poor spaniards and pulling out his heart began to bite and gnaw it with his teeth like a ravenous wolf saying to the rest 
I will serve you all alike if you show me not another way. Hereupon those miserable wretches promised to show him another way, but withal they told him it was extremely difficult and laborious. Thus to satisfy that cruel tyrant they began to lead him and his army, but finding it not for his purpose as they had told him, he was forced to return to the former way, swearing with great choler and indignation. Mordieu, les Espagnols me le parent! By God's death the Spaniards shall pay me for this! Next day he fell into another ambuscade, which he assaulted with such horrible fury that in less than an hour's time he routed the Spaniards and killed the greatest part of them. The Spaniards thought by these ambuscades better to destroy the pirates, assaulting them by degrees, and for this reason had posted themselves in several places. At last he met with a third ambuscade, where was placed a party stronger and more advantageously than the former yet notwithstanding the pirates by continually throwing little fireballs in great numbers for some time forced this party as well as the former to flee and with this so great loss of men that before they could reach the town the greatest part of the spaniards were either killed or wounded there was but one path which led to the town very well barricaded with good defences and the rest of the town was planted with shrubs called raquettes full of thorns very sharp pointed this sort of fortification seems stronger than the triangles used in Europe, when an army is of necessity to pass by the place of an enemy, it being almost impossible for the pirates to traverse those shrubs. The Spaniards posted behind the said defences, seeing the pirates come, began to ply them with their great guns, but these perceiving them ready to fire, used to stoop down, and when the shot was made, to fall upon the defendants with fireballs and naked swords, killing many of the town yet notwithstanding, not being able to advance any farther. They retired for the present. Then they renewed the attack with fewer men than before, and observing not to shoot till they were very nigh, they gave the Spaniards a charge so dexterously that with every shot they killed an enemy. The attack continuing thus eager on both sides till night, the Spaniards were compelled to hang forth a white flag and desired to come to a parley. The only conditions they required were that the pirates should give the inhabitants quarter for two hours. This little time they demanded with intent to carry away and hide as much of their goods and riches as they could, and to fly to some other neighboring town. Granting this article, they entered the town, and continued there the two hours, without committing the least hostility on the inhabitants. But no sooner was that time passed than Lolonois ordered that the inhabitants should be followed, and robbed of all they had carried away, and not only their goods, but their persons likewise to be made prisoners, though the greatest part of their merchandise and goods were so hid as the pirates could not find them, except a few leathern sacks filled with enil, or indigo. Having stayed here a few days, and, according to their custom, committing most horrid insolences, they at last quitted the place, carrying away all they possibly could, and reducing the town to ashes. Being come to the seaside, where they left a party of their own, they found these had been cruising upon the fishermen thereabouts, or who came that way from the river of Guatemala. In this river was also expected a ship from Spain. Finally they resolved to go toward the islands on the other side of the gulf, there to cleanse and careen their vessels, but they left two canoes before the coast, or rather the mouth of the river of Guatemala, in order to take the ship which, as I said, was expected from Spain. But their chief intent in going hither was to seek provisions, knowing the tortoises of those places are excellent food. Being arrived, they divided themselves, each party choosing a fit post for that fishery. They undertook to knit nets with the rinds of certain trees called makoa, whereof they make also ropes and cables, so that no vessel can be in need of such things, if they can but find the said trees. There are also many places where they find pitch in so great abundance, that running down the sea-coasts, being melted by the sun, it congeals in the water in great heaps, like small islands. This pitch is not like that of Europe, but resembles both in color and shape the froth of the sea called bitumen. But in my judgment this matter is nothing but wax mixed with sand, which stormy weather and the rolling waves of great rivers hath cast into the sea. For in those parts are great quantities of bees, who make their honey in trees, to the bodies of which the honeycomb being fixed, when tempests arise, they are torn away, and by the fury of the winds carried into the sea, as is said. 
some naturalists say that the honey and the wax are separated by the salt water whence proceeds the good amber this opinion seems the more probable because the said amber tastes as wax doth but to return to my discourse the pirates made in those islands all the haste they possibly could to equip their vessels hearing that the spanish ship was come which they expected they spent some time cruising on the coasts of yucatan where inhabit many indians who seek for the said amber in those seas and i shall here by the by make some short remarks on the manner of living of the indians and their religion they have now been above a hundred years under the spaniards to whom they performed all manners of services for whensoever any of them needed a slave or servant they sent for these to serve them as long as they pleased by the spaniards they were initiated in the principles of the christian faith and religion and they sent them every sunday and holiday a priest to perform divine service among them afterwards for reasons not known but certainly through temptations of the father of idolatry the devil they suddenly cast off the christian religion abusing the priest that was sent them this provoked the spaniards to punish them by casting many of the chiefs into prison every one of those barbarians had and hath still a god to himself whom he serves and worships it is a matter of admiration how they use a child newly born as soon as it comes into the world they carry it to the temple here they make a hole which they fill with ashes only on which they place the child naked leaving it there a whole night alone not without great danger nobody daring to come near it meanwhile the temple is open on all sides that all sorts of beasts may freely come in and out next day the father and relations of the infant return to see if the track or step of any animal appears in the ashes not finding any they leave the child there till some beast has approached the infant and left behind him the marks of his feet to this animal whatsoever it be they consecrate the creature newly born as to its god which he is bound to worship all his life esteeming the said beast his patron and protector they offer to their god sacrifices of fire wherein they burn a certain gum called by them copal whose smoke smells very deliciously when the infant is grown up the parents thereof tell him who he ought to worship and serve and honour as his own proper god then he goes to the temple where he makes offerings to the said beast afterwards if in the course of his life any one injure him or any evil happens to him he complains to that beast and sacrifices to it for revenge hence it often comes that those who have done the injury of which he complains are bitten killed or otherwise hurt by such animals after this superstitious and idolatrous manner live those miserable and ignorant indians that inhabit the islands of this gulf of honduras as also many of them on the continent of yucatan in the territories whereof are most excellent ports where those indians most commonly build their houses these people are not very faithful to one another and use strange ceremonies at their marriages whensoever any one pretends to marry a young damsel he first applies himself to her father or nearest relation he examines him nicely about the manner of cultivating their plantations and other things at his pleasure having satisfied the questions of his father-in-law he gives the young man a bow and arrow with which he repairs to the young maid and presents her with a garland of green leaves and sweet-smelling flowers this she is obliged to put on her head and lay aside that which she wore before it being the custom for virgins to go perpetually crowned with flowers this garland being received and put on her head every one of the relations and friends go to advise with others whether the marriage will be happy or not then they meet at the house of the damsel's father where they drink of a liquor made of maize or indian wheat and here before the whole company the father gives his daughter in marriage to the bridegroom next day the bride comes to her mother and in her presence pulls off the garland and tears it in pieces with great cries and lamentations many other things i could relate of the manner of living and customs of those indians but i shall follow my discourse end of chapter eight part one recording by acacia wood Twelve of Pirates of Panama, the Buccaneers of America, by A. O. Exquemelin, translated by G. A. Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Acacia Wood. Chapter Eight, Part Two. 
Our pirates, therefore, had many canoes of the Indians in the Isle of Sambale, five leagues from the coasts of Yucatan. Here is great quantity of amber, but especially when any storm arises from towards the east, whence the waves bring many things, and very different. Through this sea no vessels can pass, unless very small, it being too shallow. In the lands that are surrounded by this sea is found much campeche wood, and other things that serve for dyeing, much esteemed in Europe, and would be more, if we had the skill of the Indians, who make a dye or tincture that never fades. The pirates, having been in that gulf three months, and receiving advice that the Spanish ship was come, hastened to the port where the ship lay at anchor, and lading her merchandise, with design to assault her as soon as possible but first they thought convenient to send away some of their boats to seek for a small vessel also expected very richly laden with plate indigo and cochineal meanwhile the ship's crew having noticed that the pirates designed upon them prepared all things for a good defence being mounted with forty-two guns well furnished with arms and other necessaries and one hundred and thirty fighting men to Lolonois all this seemed but little, for he assaulted her with great courage, his own ship carrying but twenty-two guns, and having no more than a small saiety, or fly-boat, for help. But the Spaniards defended themselves so well, as they forced the pirates to retire. But the smoke of the powder continuing thick, as a dark fog or mist, with four canoes well manned, they boarded the ship with great agility, and forced the Spaniards to surrender. The ship being taken, they found not in her what they thought, being already almost unladen, all they got was only fifty bars of iron, a small parcel of paper, some earthen jars of wine, and other things of small importance. Then Lolonois called a council of war, and told them he intended for Guatemala. Hereupon they divided into several sentiments, some liking the proposal, and others disliking it, especially a party of them who were but raw in those exercises, and who imagined at their setting forth from Tortuga that pieces of eight were gathered as easy as pears from a tree, but finding most things contrary to their expectation, they quitted the fleet and returned. Others affirmed they had rather starve than return home without a great deal of money. But the major part, judging the propounded voyage little to their purpose, separated from Lolonois and the rest. Of these one Moses Van Klein was ringleader, captain of the ship taken at Porto Cavallo. This fellow steered for Tortuga to cruise to and fro in these seas. With him joined another comrade of his, by name Pierre Le Picard, who, seeing the rest leave Lolonois, thought fit to do the same. These runaways, having thus parted company, steered homewards, coasting along the continent till they came to Costa Rica. Here they landed a strong party nigh the river Veraguas, and marched in good order to the town of the same name. This they took and totally pillaged, though the Spaniards made a strong resistance. They brought away some of the inhabitants as prisoners, with all they had, which was of no great importance, by reason of the poverty of the place, which exerciseth no other trade than working in the mines, where some of the inhabitants constantly attend, while none seek for gold, but only slaves. These they compel to dig and wash the earth in the neighboring rivers, where often they find pieces of gold as big as peas. The pirates gaining in this adventure but seven or eight pounds weight of gold, they returned, giving over the design to go to the town of Nata, situate on the coast of the South Sea, whose inhabitants are rich merchants, and their slaves work in the mines of Eraguas. Being deterred by the multitudes of Spaniards gathered on all sides to fall upon them, whereof they had timely advice. Lolonois, thus left by his companions, remained alone in the Gulf of Honduras. His ship being too great to get out at the reflux of those seas, there he sustained great want of provisions, so as they were constrained to go ashore every day to seek sustenance, and not finding anything else, they were forced to kill and eat monkeys and other animals, such as they could find. At last, in the altitude of the Cape of Gracias a Dios, near a certain little island called De Las Pertes, his ship struck on a bank of sand, where it stuck so fast as no art could get her off again, though they unladed all the guns, iron, and other weighty things as much as they could. Hereupon they were forced to break the ship in pieces, and with planks and nails build themselves a boat to get away, and while they were busy about it, I shall describe the said isles and their inhabitants." The islands de las Pertas are inhabited by savage Indians, not having known or conversed with civil people. They are tall and very nimble, running almost as fast as horses. At diving also they are very dexterous and hardy. From the bottom of the sea I saw them take up an anchor of six hundred weight, tying a cable to it with great dexterity, and pulling it from a rock. Their arms are made of wood, without any iron point, but some instead thereof use a crocodile's tooth. They have no bows nor arrows, as the other Indians have, but their common weapon is a sort of lance a fathom and a half long. Here are many plantations surrounded with woods, 
whence they gather abundance of fruits, as potatoes, bananas, racoven, ananas, and many others. They have no houses to dwell in, as at other places in the Indies. Some say they eat human flesh, which is confirmed by what happened when Lolonois was there. Two of his companions, one a Frenchman and the other a Spaniard, went into the woods, where having straggled a while, a troop of Indians pursued them. They defended themselves as well as they could with their swords, but at last were forced to flee. The nimble Frenchman escaped, but the Spaniard, being not so swift, was taken and heard of no more. Some days after, twelve pirates set forth well armed to seek their companion, among whom was the Frenchman, who conducted them and showed them the place where he left him. Here they found that the Indians had kindled a fire, and at a small distance they found a man's bones well roasted with some pieces of flesh ill scraped off the bones, in one hand, which had only two fingers remaining, whence they concluded they had roasted the poor Spaniard. They marched on, seeking for Indians, and found a great number together, who endeavored to escape, but they overtook some of them, and brought aboard their ships five men and four women. With these they took much pains to make themselves be understood, and to gain their affections, giving them trifles as knives, beads, and the like. They gave them also victuals and drink, but nothing would they taste. It was also observable that while they were prisoners they spoke not one word to each other, so that seeing these poor Indians were much afraid, they presented them again with some small things, and let them go. When they parted they made signs they would come again, but they soon forgot their benefactors and were never heard of more. Neither could any notice afterwards be had of these Indians, nor any others in the whole island, which made the pirates suspect that both those that were taken and all the rest of the islanders swam away by night to some little neighboring islands, especially considering they could never set eyes on any Indian moor, nor any boat or other vessel. Meanwhile the pirates were very desirous to see their longboat finished, out of the timber that struck on the sands. Yet considering their work would be long, they began to cultivate some pieces of ground. Here they sowed French beans, which ripened in six weeks, and many other fruits. They had good provision of Spanish wheat, bananas, racoven, and other things. With the wheat they made bread, and baked it in portable ovens brought with them. Thus they feared not hunger in those desert places, employing themselves thus for five or six months. Which passed, and the longboat finished, they resolved for the river of Nicaragua, to see if they could take some canoes, and return to the said islands for their companions that remained behind, by reason the boat could not hold so many men together. Hereupon, to avoid disputes, they cast lots, determining who should go, or stay. The lot fell on one half of the people of the lost vessel who embarked in the longboat, and on the skiff which they had before, the other half remaining ashore. Lolonois, having set sail, arrived in a few days at the river of Nicaragua, here that ill fortune assailed him of which long time had been reserved for him as a punishment due to the multitude of horrible crimes committed in his licentious and wicked life here he met with both spaniards and indians who jointly setting upon him and his companions the greatest part of the pirates were killed on the place lolonois with those that remained alive had much ado to escape aboard their boats yet notwithstanding this great loss he resolved not to return to those he had left at the isle of pertus without taking some boats such as he looked for to this effect he determined to go on to the coasts of Cartagena, but God Almighty, the time of his divine justice being now come, had appointed the Indians of Darien to be the instruments and executioners thereof. These Indians of Darien are esteemed as bravos, or wild savage Indians, by the neighboring Spaniards who never could civilize them. Hither Lolonois came, brought by his evil conscience that cried for punishment, thinking to act his cruelties, but the Indians within a few days after his arrival took him prisoner, and tore him in pieces alive, throwing his body limb by limb into the fire, and his ashes into the air, that no trace or memory might remain of such an infamous, inhuman creature. One of his companions gave me an exact account of this tragedy, affirming that himself had escaped the same punishment with the greatest difficulty. He believed also that many of his comrades, who were taken in that encounter by those Indians, were as their cruel captain torn in pieces and burnt alive. Thus ends the history, the life, and miserable death of that infernal wretch Lolonois, who, full of horrid, execrable, and enormous deeds, and debtor to so much innocent blood, died by cruel and butcherly hands, such as his own were in the course of his life. Those that remained in the island de las Pertas, waiting for the return of them who got away only to their great misfortune, hearing no news of their captain or companions, at last embarked on the ship of a certain pirate who happened to pass that way. This fellow came from Jamaica with intent to land at Gracias a Dios, and from thence to enter the river with his canoes, and take the city of Cartagena. These two crews of pirates being now joined, were infinitely glad at the presence and society of one another. 
those because they found themselves delivered from their miseries poverty and necessities wherein they had lived ten entire months these because they were now considerably strengthened to effect with greater satisfaction their designs hereupon as soon as they were arrived at gracias a dios they all put themselves in the canoes and entered the river being five hundred men leaving only five or six persons in each ship to keep them they took no provisions being persuaded they should find everywhere sufficient but these their hopes were found totally vain not being grounded on almighty god for he ordained it so that the indians aware of their coming all fled not leaving in their houses or plantations which for the most part border on the sides of rivers any necessary provisions or victuals hereby in a few days after they had quitted their ships they were reduced to most extreme necessity and hunger but their hopes of making their fortunes very soon animating them for the present they contented themselves with a few green herbs such as they could gather on the banks of the river yet all this courage and vigour lasted but a fortnight when their hearts as well as bodies began to fail for hunger insomuch as they were forced to quit the river and betake themselves to the woods seeking out some villages where they might find relief but all in vain for having ranged up and down the woods for some days without finding the least comfort they were forced to return to the river where being come they thought convenient to descend to the sea-coast where they had left their ships not having been able to find what they sought for in this laborious journey they were reduced to such extremity that many of them devoured their own shoes the sheaths of their swords knives and other such things being almost ravenous and eager to meet some indians intending to sacrifice them to their teeth at last they arrived at the sea-coast where they found some comfort and relief to their former miseries and also means to seek more yet the greatest part perished through faintness and other diseases contracted by hunger which also caused the remaining part to disperse till at last by degrees many or most of them fell into the same pit that lolonois did of whom and of whose companions having given a compendious narrative i shall continue with the actions and exploits of captain henry morgan who may deservedly be called the second lolonois not being unlike or inferior to him either in achievements against the spaniards or in robberies of many innocent people End of chapter eight part two recording by acacia wood section thirteen of pirates of panama the buccaneers of america by a o esquimelin translated by g a williams this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by lars rolander chapter nine the origin and descent of captain henry morgan his exploits and the most remarkable actions of his life captain henry morgan was born in great britain in the principality of wales his father was a rich yeoman or farmer of good quality even as most who bear that name in wales are known to be morgan when young had no inclination to the calling of his father and therefore left his country and came towards the sea coasts to seek some other employment more suitable to his aspiring humour where he found several ships at anchor bound for barbados with these he resolved to go in the service of one who according to the practice of those parts sold him as soon as he came ashore he served his time at barbados and obtaining his liberty betook himself to jamaica there to seek new fortunes here he found two vessels of pirates ready to go to sea and being destitute of employment he went with them with intent to follow the exercises of that sort of people he soon learned their manner of living so exactly that having performed three or four voyages with profit and success he agreed with some of his comrades who had got by the same voyages a little money to join stocks and buy a ship the vessel being bought they unanimously choose him captain and commander with this ship he set forth from jamaica to cruise on the coasts of campeche in which voyage he took several ships with which he returned triumphant here he found an old pirate named mansfeld whom we have already mentioned busied in equipping a considerable fleet with design to land on the continent and pillage whatever he could 
Mansfeld, seeing Captain Morgan return with so many prizes, judged him to be a man of courage, and chose him for his vice-admiral in that expedition. Thus, having fitted out fifteen ships, great and small, they sailed from Jamaica with five hundred men, balloons and French. This fleet arrived not long after at the Isle of St. Catherine, near the continent of Costa Rica, latitude twelve degrees thirteen minutes, and distant thirty-five leagues from the river Chagre. Here they made their first descent, landing most of their men, who soon forced the garrison that kept the island to surrender all the forts and castles thereof which they instantly demolished, except one, wherein they placed a hundred men of their own party, and all the slaves they had taken from the Spaniards. With the rest of their men they marched to another small island so near St. Catherine's that, with a bridge they made in a few days, they passed thither, taking with them all the ordnance they had taken on the great island having ruined with fire and sword both the islands leaving necessary orders at the said castle they put to sea again with their spanish prisoners yet these they set ashore not long after on the firm land near puerto velo then they cruised on costa rica till they came to the river colla designing to pillage all the towns in those parts thence to pass to the village of nata to do the same the governor of panama on advice of their arrival and of the hostilities they committed thought it his duty to meet them with a body of men his coming caused the pirates to retire suddenly seeing the whole country was alarmed and that their designs were known and consequently defeated at that time hereupon they returned to st catherine's to visit the hundred men they left in the garrison there the governor of these men was a Frenchman named Le Sieur Simon, who behaved himself very well in that charge. While Mansfeld was absent, having put the great island in a very good posture of defence, and the little one he had caused to be cultivated with many fertile plantations, sufficient to revictual the whole fleet, not only for the present, but also for a new voyage. Mansfeld was very much bent to keep the two islands in perpetual possession, being very commodiously situated for the pirates, being so near the Spanish dominions and easily defended. Hereupon Mansfeld determined to return to Jamaica to send recruits to St. Catherine's, that, in case of an invasion, the pirates might be provided for a defence. As soon as he arrived, he propounded his intentions to the governor there, who rejected his propositions, fearing to displease his master, the King of England. Besides that giving him the men he desired, and necessaries, he must of necessity diminish the forces of that island whereof he was governor. Hereupon Mansfeld, knowing that of himself he could not compass his designs, he went to Tortuga, but there, before he could put in execution what was intended, death surprised him and put a period to his wicked life, leaving all things in suspense till the occasion I shall hereafter relate. Le Sieur Simon, governor of St. Catherine's, receiving no news from Mansfeld, his admiral, was impatiently desirous to know the cause thereof. Meanwhile, Don Pierres de Guzman, being newly come to the government of Costa Rica, thought it not convenient for the interest of Spain for that island to be in the hands of the pirates. Hereupon he equipped a considerable fleet, which he sent to retake it. But before he used violence, he writ a letter to Le Sieur Simon, telling him that if he would surrender the island to his Catholic Majesty, he should be very well rewarded, but in case of refusal severely punished, when he had forced him to do it. Le Sieur Simon, seeing no probability of being able to defend it alone, nor any emolument that by so doing could accrue either to him or his people, after some small resistance delivered it up to its true lord and master. 
under the same articles they had obtained it from the Spaniards. A few days after which surrender, there arrived from Jamaica an English ship, which the governor there had sent under hand with a good supply of people, both men and women. The Spaniards from the castle having espied the ship, put forth English colours, and persuaded Le Sieur Simon to go aboard and conduct the ship into a port they assigned him. This he performed, and they were all made prisoners. A certain Spanish engineer has published in print an exact relation of the retaking of the isle by the Spaniards, which I have thought fit to insert here. A true relation and particular account of the victory obtained by the arms of his Catholic Majesty against the English pirates, by the direction and valour of Don John Pérez de Guzman, Knight of the Order of St. James, Governor and Captain-General of Terra Firma, and the province of Veraguas. The kingdom of Terra Firma, which of itself is sufficiently strong to repel and destroy great fleets, especially the pirates of Jamaica, had several ways notice imparted to the governor thereof that fourteen English vessels cruised on the coasts belonging to his Catholic Majesty. July 14, 1665, news came to Panama that they were arrived at Puerto de Naos, and had forced the Spanish garrison of the Isle of St. Catherine, whose governor was Don Esteban del Campo, and possessed themselves of the said island, taking prisoners, the inhabitants, and destroying all that they met. About the same time Don John Pérez de Guzman received particular information of these robberies from some Spaniards who escaped out of the island, and whom he ordered to be conveyed to Puerto Velo, that the said pirates came into the island May 2nd by night without being perceived, and that the next day after some skirmishes they took the fortresses and made prisoners all the inhabitants and soldiers that could not escape. Upon this Don John called a council of war, wherein he declared the great progress the said pirates had made in the dominions of his Catholic Majesty, and propounded that it was absolutely necessary to send some forces to the Isle of St. Catherine, sufficient to retake it from the pirates, the honour and interest of His Majesty of Spain being very narrowly concerned herein. Otherwise the pirates, by such conquests, might easily in course of time possess themselves of all the countries thereabouts. To this some made answer, that the pirates, not being able to subsist in the said island, would of necessity consume and waste themselves, and be forced to quit it, without any necessity of retaking it that consequently it was not worth the while to engage in so many expenses and troubles as this would cost. Notwithstanding which, Don John, being an expert and valiant soldier, ordered that provisions should be conveyed to Puerto Velo for the use of the militia, and transported himself thither with no small danger of his life. Here he arrived July 2nd with most things necessary to the expedition in hand, where he found in the port a good ship and well-mounted, called the St. Vincent, that belonged to the company of the Negroes, which he manned and victualled very well, and sent to the Isle of St. Catherine, constituting Captain Joseph Sanchez Jiménez, Major of Puerto Velo, commander thereof. He carried with him two hundred and seventy soldiers and thirty-seven prisoners of the same island, besides thirty-four Spaniards of the garrison of Puerto Velo, twenty-nine mulattoes of Panama, twelve Indians, very dexterous at shooting with bows and arrows, seven expert and able gunners, two lieutenants, two pilots, one surgeon, and one priest of the order of St. Francis for their chaplain. Don John soon after gave orders to all the officers how to behave themselves, telling them that the governor of Cartagena would supply them with more men, boats, and all things else necessary for that enterprise, to which effect he had already written to the said governor. July 24th, Don John setting sail with a fair wind, he called before him all his people, 
and made them a speech, encouraging them to fight against the enemies of their country and religion, and especially against those inhuman pirates who had committed so many horrid cruelties upon the subjects of his Catholic majesty. With all promising every one most liberal rewards, especially to such as should behave themselves well in the service of their king and country. Thus Don John bid them farewell, and the ship set sail under a favourable gale. The twenty-second they arrived at Cartagena, and presented a letter to the governor thereof, from the noble and valiant Don John, who received it with testimonies of great affection to the person of Don John and his majesty's service and seeing their resolution to be comfortable to his desires he promised them his assistance with one frigate one galleon one boat and one hundred and twenty-six men one half out of his own garrison and the other half mulattoes thus being well provided with necessaries they left the port of cartagena august second and the tenth they arrived in sight of st catherine's towards the western point thereof and though the wind was contrary yet they reached the port and anchored within it having lost one of their boats by foul weather at the rock called quita Sinos. the pirates seeing our ships come to an anchor gave them presently three guns with bullets which were soon answered in the same coin hereupon major joseph sanchez jimenez sent ashore to the pirates one of his officers to require them in the name of the catholic king his master to surrender the island seeing they had taken it in the midst of peace between the two crowns of spain and england and that if they would be obstinate he would certainly put them all to the sword the pirates made answer that the island had once before belonged unto the governor and dominion of the king of england and that instead of surrendering it they preferred to lose their lives on friday the thirteenth three negroes from the enemy came swimming aboard our admiral these brought intelligence that all the pirates upon the island were only seventy-two in number and that they were under a great consternation seeing such considerable forces come against them with this intelligence the spaniards resolved to land and advance towards the fortresses which ceased not to fire as many great guns against them as they possibly could which were answered in the same manner on our side till dark night on sunday the fifteenth the day of the assumption of our lady the weather being very calm and clear the Spaniards began to advance thus. The ship St. Vincent, riding admiral, discharged two whole broadsides on the battery called the Conception. The ship St. Peter, that was vice-admiral, discharged likewise her guns against the other battery named St. James. Meanwhile our people landed in small boats, directing their course towards the point of the battery last mentioned and thence they marched towards the gate called Cortadura. Lieutenant Francis de Cazeres, being desirous to view the strength of the enemy with only fifteen men, was compelled to retreat in haste by reason of the great guns, which played so furiously on the place where he stood, they shooting not only pieces of iron and small bullets, but also the organs of the church, discharging in every shot three score pipes at a time notwithstanding this heat of the enemy captain don joseph ramirez de leyva with sixty men made a strong attack wherein they fought on both sides very desperately till at least he overcame and forced the pirates to surrender the fort on the other side captain john galeno with ninety men passed over the hills to advance that way towards the castle of saint teresa Meanwhile, Major Don Joseph Sanchez Jimenez, as commander-in-chief, with the rest of his men set forth from the battery of St. James, passing the port with four boats, and landing in despite of the enemy. About this same time Captain John Galeno began to advance with the men he led from the forementioned fortress, so that our men made the three attacks on three several sides at one and the same time, with great courage 
till the pirates seeing many of their men already killed, and that they could in no manner subsist any longer, retreated towards Cortadura, where they surrendered themselves and the whole island into our hands. Our people possessed themselves of all, and set up the Spanish colours as soon as they had rendered thanks to God Almighty for the victory obtained on such a signalised day. The number of dead were six men of the enemies, with many wounded and seventy prisoners. On our side was only one man killed and four wounded. There were found on the island eight hundred pounds of powder, two hundred and fifty pounds of small bullets, with many other military provisions. Among the prisoners were taken also two Spaniards, who had bore arms under the English against his Catholic Majesty. These were shot to death the next day, by order of the Major. The tenth day of September arrived at the isle an English vessel, which being seen at a great distance by the Major, he ordered Le Sieur Semon, who was a Frenchman, to go and visit the said ship, and tell them that were on board that the island belonged still to the English. He performed the command, and found in the said ship only fourteen men, one woman and her daughter, who were all instantly made prisoners. The English pirates were all transported to Puerto Velo, excepting three who by order of the governor were carried to Panama, there to work in the castle of St. Jerome. This fortification is an excellent piece of workmanship, and very strong, being raised in the middle of the port of a quadrangle form, and of very hard stone. Its height is eighty-eight geometrical feet, the wall being fourteen, and the curtain seventy-five feet in diameter. It was built at the expense of several private persons, the governor of the city furnishing the greatest part of the money, so that it cost his majesty nothing. End of chapter 9 Read by Lars Rolander Section 14 of Pirates of Panama the Buccaneers of America by A. O. Exquemelin. Translated by G. A. Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Chapter 10 Of the Island of Cuba. Captain Morgan attempts to preserve the Isle of St. Catherine as a refuge to the nest of pirates, but fails of his design. He arrives at and takes the village of El Puerto del Principe. Captain Morgan, seeing his predecessor and admiral, Mansfeld, were dead, used all the means that were possible to keep in possession the Isle of St. Catherine, seated near Cuba. His chief intent was to make it a refuge and sanctuary to the pirates of those parts, putting it in a condition of being a convenient receptacle of their preys and robberies. To this effect he left no stone unmoved, writing to several merchants in Virginia and New England, persuading them to send him provisions and necessaries towards putting the said island in such a posture of defence as to fear no danger of invasion from any side. But all this proved ineffectual by the Spaniards retaking the said island. Yet Captain Morgan retained his courage, which put him on new designs. First he equipped a ship in order to gather a fleet as great and as strong as he could. By degrees he effected it, and gave orders to every member of his fleet to meet at a certain port of Cuba, there determining to call a council, and deliberate what was best to be done, and what place first to fall upon. Leaving these preparations in this condition, I shall give my reader some small account of the said Isle of Cuba, 
in whose port this expedition was hatched, seeing I omitted to do it in its proper place. Cuba lies from east to west in north latitude, from twenty to twenty-third degree, in length one hundred and fifty German leagues, and about forty in breadth. Its fertility is equal to that of Hispaniola, besides which it affords many things proper for trading and commerce, such as hides of several beasts, particularly those that in Europe are called hides of Havana. On all sides it is surrounded with many small islands, called the Chaos. These little islands the pirates use as ports of refuge. Here they have their meetings and hold their councils, how best to assault the Spaniards. It is watered on all sides with plentiful and pleasant rivers, whose entries form secure and spacious ports, beside many other harbours for ships, which along the calm shores and coasts adorn this rich and beautiful island all which contribute much to its happiness by facilitating trade, whereto they invited both natives and aliens. The chief of these ports are San Jago, Bayam, Santa Maria, Espiritu Santo, Trinidad, Sagua, Carbo de Corrientes, and others on the south side of the island. On the north side are La Havana, Puerto Mariano, Santa Cruz, Mataricos, and Baracoa. This island has two chief cities, to which all the towns and villages thereof give obedience. The first is Santa Jago, or St. James, seated on the south side, and having under its jurisdiction one half of the island. The chief magistrates hereof are a bishop and a governor, who command the villages and towns of the said half. The chief of these are, on the south side, Espiritu Santo, Puerto del Principe, and Bayame. On the north it has Baracoa and De Los Cayos. The greatest part of the commerce driven here comes from the Canaries whither they transport much tobacco, sugar, and hides, which sort of merchandise are drawn to the head city from the subordinate towns and villages. Formerly the city of Santa Jago was miserably sacked by the pirates of Jamaica and Tortuga, though it is defeated by a considerable castle. The city and port de la Havana lies between the north and west side of the island, this is one of the strongest places of the West Indies. Its jurisdiction extends over the other half of the island, the chief places under it being Santa Cruz on the north side and La Trinidad on the south. Hence is transported huge quantities of tobacco, which is sent to New Spain and Costa Rica, even as far as the South Sea. Besides many ships laden with this commodity, that are consigned to Spain and other parts of Europe, not only in the leaf, but in rolls. This city is defended by three castles, very great and strong, two of which lie towards the port, and the other is seated on a hill that commands the town. It is esteemed to contain about ten thousand families. The merchants of this place trade in New Spain, Campeche, Honduras, and Florida. All ships that come from the parts before mentioned, as also from Caracas, Cartagena, and Costa Rica, are necessitated to take their provisions in at Havana, to make their voyage for Spain. This being the necessary and straight course they must steer for the south of Europe and other parts. The plate fleet of Spain which the Spaniards call Flota, being homeward bound, touches here yearly to complete their cargo with hides, tobacco, and Campeche wood. Captain Morgan had been but two months in these ports of the south of Cuba, when he had got together a fleet of twelve sail, 
between ships and great boats, with several hundred fighting men, part English and part French. They called a council, and some advised to assault the city of Havana in the night, which they said might easily be done if they could but take any of the ecclesiastics. Yea, that the city might be sacked before the castles could put themselves in a posture of defence. Others propounded, according to their several opinions, other attempts. But the former proposal was rejected, because many of the pirates who had been prisoners at other times in the said city affirmed nothing of consequence could be done with less than one thousand five hundred men. Moreover, that, with all these people, they ought first go to the island de los Pinos, and land them in small boats about Matamona, fourteen leagues from the said city, whereby to accomplish their designs. Finally, they saw no possibility of gathering so great a fleet, and hereupon, with what they had, they concluded to attempt some other place. Among the rest, one propounded they should assault the town of El Puerto del Principe. This proposition he persuaded to by saying he knew that place very well, and that being at a distance from sea, it never was sacked by any pirates, whereby the inhabitants were rich, exercising their trade by ready money, with those of Havana, who kept here an established commerce, chiefly in hides. This proposal was presently admitted by Captain Morgan, and the chief of his companions. Hereupon they ordered every captain to weigh anchor and set sail, steering towards that coast nearest to El Puerto del Principe. Here is a bay named by the Spaniards El Puerto de Santa Maria. Being arrived at this bay, a Spaniard, who was prisoner aboard the fleet, swam ashore by night to the town of El Puerto del Principe, giving an account to the inhabitants of the design of the pirates, which he overheard in their discourse, while they thought he did not understand English. The Spaniards, upon this advice, began to hide their riches and carry away their movables. The governor immediately raised all the people of the town, freemen and slaves, and with part of them took a post by which of necessity the pirates must pass, and commanded many trees to be cut down and laid across the ways to hinder their passage, placing several ambuscades strengthened with some pieces of cannon to play upon them on their march. He gathered in all about eight hundred men, of which detaching part into the said ambuscades, with the rest he begirt the town, drawing them up in a spacious field whence they could see the coming of the pirates at length captain morgan with his men now on the march found the avenues to the town unpassable hereupon they took their way through the wood traversing it with great difficulty whereby they escaped diverse ambuscades at last they came to the plain from its figure called by the spaniards la savanna or the sheet. The governor, seeing them come, detached a troop of horse to charge them in the front, thinking to disperse them, and to pursue them with his main body. But this design succeeded not, for the pirates marched in very good order, at the sound of their drums and with flying colours. Coming near the horse, they drew into a semicircle, and so advanced towards the Spaniards, who charged them valiantly for a while. But the pirates, being very dexterous at their arms, and their governor, with many of their companions being killed, they retreated towards the wood, to save themselves with more advantage. But before they could reach it, most of them were unfortunately killed by the pirates. Thus they left the victory to these new-come enemies, who had no considerable loss of men in the battle, and but very few wounded. The skirmish lasted four hours. 
they entered the town, not without great resistance of such as were within, who defended themselves as long as possible, and many seeing the enemy in the town shut themselves up in their own houses, and thence made several shots upon the pirates, who thereupon threatened them, saying, If you surrender not voluntarily, you shall soon see the town in a flame, and your wives and children torn to pieces before your faces. Upon these menaces the Spaniards submitted to the discretion of the pirates, believing they could not continue there long. As soon as the pirates had possessed themselves of the town, they enclosed all the Spaniards, men, women, children, and slaves, in several churches, and pillaged all the goods they could find. Then they searched the country round about, bringing in daily many goods and prisoners, with much provision. With this they fell to making great cheer, after their old custom, without remembering the poor prisoners, whom they let starve in the churches, though they tormented them daily and inhumanly, to make them confess where they had hid their goods, money, etc., though little or nothing was left them, not sparing the women and little children, giving them nothing to eat, whereby the greatest part perished. Pillage and provisions growing scarce, they thought convenient to depart and seek new fortunes in other places. They told the prisoners they should find money to ransom themselves, else they should be all transported to Jamaica, and beside, if they did not pay a second ransom for the town, they would turn every house into ashes. The Spaniards hereupon nominated among themselves four fellow prisoners to go and seek for the above-mentioned contributions. But the pirates, to the intent that they should return speedily with those ransoms, tormented several cruelly in their presence before they departed. After a few days the Spaniards returned, telling Captain Morgan, We have ran up and down, and searched all the neighboring woods and places we most suspected, and yet have not been able to find any of our own party, nor consequently any fruit of our embassy. But if you are pleased to have a little longer patience with us, we shall certainly cause all that you demand to be paid within fifteen days, which Captain Morgan granted. But not long after, there came into the town seven or eight pirates who had been ranging in the woods and fields, and got considerable booty. These brought amongst other prisoners a negro, whom they had taken with letters. Captain Morgan, having perused them, found that they were from the governor of Santa Iago, being written to some of the prisoners, wherein he told them they should not make too much haste to pay any ransom for their town or persons, or any other pretext, but, on the contrary, they should put off the pirates as well as they could, with excuses and delays expecting to be relieved by him in a short time, when he would certainly come to their aid. Upon this intelligence, Captain Morgan immediately ordered all their plunder to be carried aboard, and withal he told the Spaniards that the very next day they should pay their ransoms, for he would not wait a moment longer, but reduce the whole town to ashes if they failed of the sum he demanded. With this intimation, Captain Morgan made no mention to the Spaniards of the letters he had intercepted. They answered that it was impossible for them to give such a sum of money in so short a space of time, seeing their fellow townsmen were not to be found in all the country thereabouts. Captain Morgan knew full well their intentions, but thought it not convenient to stay there any longer demanding of them only five hundred oxen or cows, with sufficient salt to powder them. With this condition, 
that they should carry them on board his ships. Thus he departed with all his men, taking with him only six of the principal prisoners as pledges. Next day the Spaniards brought the cattle and salt to the ships, and required the prisoners. But Captain Morgan refused to deliver them, till they had helped his men to kill and salt the beeves. This was performed in great haste, he not caring to stay there any longer, lest he should be surprised by the forces that were gathering against him. And having received all on board his vessels, he set at liberty the hostages. Meanwhile there happened some dissensions between the English and the French. The occasion was as follows. A Frenchman, being employed in killing and salting the beeves, an English pirate took away the marrow bones he had taken out of the ox, which these people esteem much. Hereupon they challenged one another. Being come to the place of duel, the Englishman stabbed the Frenchman in the back, whereby he fell down dead. The other Frenchmen, desirous of revenge, made an insurrection against the English. But Captain Morgan soon appeased them by putting the criminal in chains to be carried to Jamaica, promising he would see justice done upon him, for though he might challenge his adversary, yet it was not lawful to kill him treacherously, as he did. All things being ready and on board, and the prisoners set at liberty, they sailed thence to a certain island, where Captain Morgan intended to make a dividend of what they had purchased in that voyage, where, being arrived, they found nigh the value of fifty thousand pieces of eight in money and goods, the sum being known it caused a general grief to see such a small purchase not sufficient to pay their debts at Jamaica. Hereupon Captain Morgan proposed they should think on some other enterprise and pillage before they returned. But the French, not being able to agree with the English, left Captain Morgan with those of his own nation, notwithstanding all the persuasions he used to reduce them to continue in his company. Thus they parted with all external signs of friendship. Captain Morgan, reiterating his promise to them that he would see justice done on that criminal. This he performed, for being arrived at Jamaica, he caused him to be hanged, which was all the satisfaction the French pirates could expect. End of chapter 10 Read by Lars Rolander The Book Nears of America by A. O. X. Herman. Translated by G. A. Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Veron Real. Chapter 11. Captain Morgan resolving to attack and plan the city of Puerto Bello, equips a fleet, and with little expense and small forces takes it. Some may think that the French, having deserted Captain Morgan, the English alone could not have sufficient courage to attempt such great actions as before. But Captain Morgan, who always communicated vigour with his words, infused such spirit into his men as put them instantly upon new designs, they being all persuaded that the sole execution of his orders would be a certain means of obtaining great riches, for it so influenced their minds that with inimitable courage they all resolved to follow him, as did also a certain pirate of Compiché, who on this occasion joined with Captain Morgan to seek new fortunes under his conduct. Thus Captain Morgan in a few days gathered a fleet of nine sail, either ships or great boats, wherein he had four hundred and sixty military men. All things being ready, they put forth to sea, Captain Morgan parting his eye to nobody at present, he only told them on several occasions that he doubted not to make a good fortune by that voyage. If strange occurrences happened not, they steered toward the continent, where they arrived in a few days near Costa Rica, 
all their fleet safe no sooner had they discovered land but captain morgan declared his intentions to captains and presently after to the company he told them he intended to plunder puerto bello by night being resolved to put the whole city to the sack and to encourage them he added his enterprise could not fail seeing he had kept it secret without revealing it to anybody whereby they could not have notice of his coming to this proposition some answered that not a sufficient number of men to assault so strong and great a city but captain morgan replied for a number is small our hearts are great and the fewer persons we are the more union and better shares we shall have in the spoil hereupon being simulated with the hope of those vast riches they promised themselves from their success they unanimously agreed to that design now that my reader may better comprehend the boldness of this exploit it may be necessary to say something beforehand of the city of Puerto this city is in the province of costa rica ten degrees north latitude fourteen leagues from the gulf of darien and eight westwards from port called nombre de dios it is judged the strongest place the king of spain possesses in all the west indies except havana and carthagena here are two castles almost impregnable that defend the city situate the entry of the port so that no ship or boat can pass without permission the garrison consists of three hundred soldiers and the town is inhabited by about four hundred families the merchants dwell not there but only reside a while when the galleons come from or go for spain by reason of the unhealthiness of the air occasioned by vapours from mountains so that though their chief warehouses are at puerto bello their habitations are at panama whence they bring their plate upon moles when the fair begins and when the ships belonging to a company of negroes arrive to sell slaves captain morgan who knew very well all the avenues of the city and the neighbouring coasts arrived in the dusk of the evening at puerto de naus ten leagues to the west of puerto bello being come hither they sailed up the river to the harbour called puerto pontin where they anchored here they put themselves into boats and canoes leaving in the ships only a few men to bring them the next day to the port about midnight they came to a place called estera longa lemos where they all went on the shore and marched by land to a first post of the city that in their company an englishman for me a prisoner in these parts who now served them for a guide to him and three or four more they gave commission to take the sentinel if possible to kill him on the place but they seized him so cunningly as he had no time to give warning with his musket or make any noise and brought him with his hands bound to captain morgan who asked him how things went in the city and what forces they had with other circumstances he desired to know after every question they made him a thousand messes to kill him even declared not the truth then they advanced to the city carrying the said sentinel bound before them having marched about a quarter of a league they came to a castle near the city which presently they closely surrounded so that no person could get either in or out being posted under the walls of the castle captain morgan commanded a sentinel whom they had taken prisoner to speak to those within charging them to surrender to his discretion otherwise they should all be cut in pieces without quarter but they regarding none of these threats began instantly to fire which alarmed the city yet notwithstanding though the governor and soldiers of the said castle made as great resistance as could be they were forced to surrender having taken the castle they resolved to be as good as the words putting the spaniards to the sword thereby to strike a terror into the rest of the city whereupon having shut up all the soldiers and officers as prisoners into one room they set fire to a powder whereof they found great quantity and blew up the castle into the air with all the spaniards that were within this done they pursued the course of the victory flying upon the city which as yet was not ready to receive them many of the inhabitants cast their precious jewels and money into wells and cisterns or hid them in places and the ground to avoid as much as possible being totally robbed one of the party of pirates assigned to this purpose ran immediately to cloisters and to as many religious men and women as they could find the governor of the city not being able to the citizens through their great confusion retired to one of the castles remaining and thence fired incessantly at the pirates but these were not in the least negligent either to assault him or defend themselves till amidst the horror of the assault they made very few shots in vain 
for aiming with great dexterity at the mouths of the guns the spaniards were certain to lose one or two men every time they charged each gun anew this continued very furious from break of day till noon yet about this time of the day the case was very dubious which party should conquer or be conquered at last the pirates perceiving they had lost many men and yet advanced but little towards gaining either this or the other castles made use of fireballs which they threw with their hands designing to burn the doors of the castles but the spaniards from the walls let fall great quantities of stones and northern pots full of powder and other combustible matter which forced them to desist captain morgan seeing this generous defence made by the spaniards began to despair of success hereupon many vain and calm meditations came into his mind neither could he determine which way to turn himself in that strait being thus puzzled he was suddenly animated to continue the assault by seeing english colours put forth at one of the lesser castles then entered by his men of whom he presently after spied a troop coming to meet him proclaiming victory with a loud shout of joy this instantly put him on the resolutions of taking the rest of the castles especially seeing the chiefest citizens were fled to them and had conveyed thither great part of their riches with all the plate belonging to the churches and divine service to this effect he ordered ten or twelve ladders to be made in all haste so broad that three or four men at once might attend them these being finished he commanded all the religious men and women whom he had taken prisoners to fix them against the walls of castle this he had before threatened governor to do if he delivered not the castle but his answer was he would never surrender himself with life captain morgan was persuaded the governor would not employ his utmost force seeing the religious women and the ecclesiastical persons exposed in front of the soldiers to the greatest danger thus the ladders as i have said were put into the hands of religious persons of both sexes and these were forced at the head of the companies to raise and ply them to the walls but captain morgan was fully deceived in his judgment of his design for the governor who acted like a brave soldier in performance of his duty used his utmost endeavour to destroy whosoever came near the walls the religious men and women ceased not to cry to him and beg of him by all the saints of heaven to deliver the castle and spare both his and their own lives but nothing could prevail with his obstinacy and fierceness thus many of the religious men and nuns were killed before they could fix the ladders which at last being done though with great loss of the said religious people the pirates mounted them in great numbers and with not less valour having fireballs in their hands and earthen pots full of powder all which things being now at the top of the walls they cannot and cast in among the spaniards this effort of pirates was very great insomuch that the spaniards could no longer resist nor defend the castle which was now entered hereupon they all threw down their arms and craved quarter for their lives only the governor of the city would crave no mercy but killed many of the pirates with his own hands and not a few of his own soldiers because they did not stand to their arms and though the pirates asked him if he would have quarter yet he constantly answered by no means i had rather die as a valiant soldier than be hanged as a coward they endeavoured as much as they could to take him prisoner but he defended himself so obstinately that they were forced to kill him notwithstanding all the cries and tears of his own wife and daughter who begged him on their knees to demand quarter and save his life when the pirates had possessed themselves of the castle which was about night they enclosed therein all their prisoners placing the women and men by themselves with some guards the wounded were put in an apartment by itself that their own complaints might be the cure of their diseases for no other was afforded them this done they fell to eating and drinking as usual that is committing in both all manner of debauchery and excess so that fifty courageous men might easily have retaken the city and killed all the pirates next day having plundered all they could find they examined some of the prisoners who had been persuaded by their companions to say that they were the richest of the town charging them severely to discover where they had hid their riches and goods not being able to extort anything from them they not being the right persons it was resolved to torture them this they did so cruelly that many of them died on the wreck or presently after now the president of panama being advertised of the pillage and ruin of Portobello, he employed all his care and industry to raise forces to pursue and cast out the pirates thence but these cared little for his preparations having their ships at hand and determining to fire the city and retreat 
They had now been at Puerto Bello fifteen days, in which time they had lost many of their men, both by the unhealthiness of the country and by extravagant debaucheries. Hereupon they prepared to depart, carrying on board all the pillage they had got, having first provided the fleet with sufficient victuals for the voyage. While these things were doing, Captain Morgan demanded of the prisoners a ransom for the city, or else he would burn it down and blow up all the castles withal. He commanded them to send speedily two persons to procure the sum, which was one hundred thousand pieces of eight. To this effect two men were sent to the president of Panama, who gave him an account of all. The president, having now a body of men ready, set forth towards Puerto Bello to encounter the pirates before their retreat. But they, hearing of his coming, instead of flying away, went out to meet him at the narrow passage, which he must pass. Here they placed a hundred men, very well armed, which at the first encounter put to flight a good party of those of Panama. This obliged the president to retire for that time, not being yet in posture of strength to proceed farther. Presently after, he sent a message to Captain Morgan, to tell him that if he departed not suddenly with all his forces from Puerto Bello, he ought to expect no quarter of himself, nor his companions, when he should take them, as he hoped soon to do. Captain Morgan, who feared not his threat, knowing he had a secure retreat in his ships, which were at hand, answered, he would not deliver the castles before he had received the contribution money he had demanded, which if it were not paid down, he would certainly burn the whole city, and then leave it, demolishing beforehand the castles and killing the prisoners. The governor of Panama perceived by this answer that no means would serve to modify the hearts of pirates, nor reduce them to reason. Hereupon, he determined to leave them, as also those of the city whom he came to relieve, involved in the difficulties of making the best agreement they could. Thus in a few days, more than miserable citizens gathered contributions required, and bought one hundred thousand pieces of eight to pirates for a ransom of their cruel captivity. But the president of Panama was much amazed to consider that four hundred men could take such a great city, with so many strong castles, especially having no ordnance, wherewith to raise batteries, and what was more, when the citizens of Puerto had always great repute of being good soldiers themselves, and who never wanted courage in their own defence. This astonishment was so great, as made them send to Captain Morgan, desiring some small pattern of those arms wherewith he had taken with much vigour so great a city. Captain Morgan received this messenger very kindly, and with great civility, and gave him a pistol and a few small bullets to carry back to the president his master, telling him withal, he desired him to accept that send the pattern of the arms wherewith he had taken Puerto Bello, and keep them for a twelve month, after which time he promised to come to Panama, and fetch him away. The governor returned the present very soon to Captain Morgan, giving him thanks for the favour of lending him such weapons as he needed not, and withal sent him a ring of gold with this message, that he desired him not to give himself the labour of coming to Panama, as he had done to Puerto Bello, for he did assure him he should not speak so well here as he had done there. After this, Captain Morgan, having provided his fleet with all necessaries, and taken with him the best guns of the castles, laying up the rest, set sail from Puerto Bello with all his ships, and arriving in a few days at Cuba, he sought out a place wherein he might quickly make the dividends of their sport. They found in ready money two hundred and fifty thousand pieces of eight, besides other merchandises, as cloth, linen, silks, etc. With this rich purchase, they sailed thence to a common place of rendezvous, Jamaica. Being arrived, they passed here some time in all sorts of vices and debaucheries, according to their custom, spending very practically what others had gained with no small labour on top. End of chapter 11